I, I know this is the biggest thing in Seattle tonight, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, <clears throat> and you're definitely thinking about climate change on a night like tonight, so this is, this is really perfect. Um, a little bit about who I am and how I came to this topic before we, we go on. I'm a magazine writer, as he said, and I live in Columbia City. And a number of years ago now, <laughs> uh, I went for Harper's Magazine to the Arctic. There was a mission by the Canadian military to defend the Northwest Passage from invaders. Invaders would basically be us or Europeans. The idea being that the ice is pulling back and that this is a shipping route that people could use. This, of course, is the route that goes across the top of North America from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Explorers sought it for years. And once they found it, of course, it was ice covered. 2006, 2007, the ice was beginning to pull back and it became something worth fighting over. And so Canada went up there, they had you know, battleships, they had guns. I sat on the deck with them and we <clears throat> didn't live fire drills. They shot howitzers at other fake American boats. We had this big landing where we, uh, our charts were really bad and the Arctic's kind of unmapped. And so we, we were trying to get into this bay on Devon Island. Devon Island is up at about 70 degrees north and it's, it was known before for the Mars on Earth project, which is basically we looked around the planet for the closest analog to Mars and then sent people up there to practice living in a, a really barren environment. So before this, it was known for that. Then the Canadians decided to invade it. Um, but a lot of tour groups go there first and the tour groups had better maps than the military did. So we, <laughs> so we, we actually pulled, we were probably, I don't know, a mile off the coast. The tour boat went past us. They all, all these old people in life jackets got off, walked up onto the beach. We're taking all these photos, and then we pull up eventually in our Zodiacs and you know have rifles and, and all that. And it was a really valiant invasion. And um, <clears throat> so uh, the reason this, I thought, like many of us, that climate change was kind of boring. I thought as a, it's important, but one of those things is actually really hard to cover because it's not happening in real time. This is years ago, obviously, I've, I've changed my mind. But I, you know, I thought it was about cap and trade or you know, these big sort of scientific things that are too slow to see. I'd, I'd been like many of us, and this was the first time I looked at it and thought, you know, this is really weird. First of all, it's Canadians with guns. And second of all, <laughs> second of all it's, it's reacting to this physical reality of climate change. It's not people changing their light bulbs. It's not all these things we just think about with climate change. It's, it's looking at it as a strategic thing. And, and that was what set me on this path. And I went to 24 countries around the world, a dozen states, and looked at people trying to, you know, trying to get the high ground, basically, with climate change. So what I'm gonna do now is a uh, sort of a mix, a buffet of things. Uh, first would be, I'm gonna read from the book. Well, that's actually second. <laughs> um, first is talking, which is what I'm doing now. Then I'm gonna read from the book. And uh, then after that, I'm gonna show some slides. And, and then you can do questions after that. Uh, the framing question I wanna start this with is this concept of tragedy of the commons. Insofar as people in this country think about climate change, which outside of Seattle, a lot of people don't, or they think it's about the debate over whether it's, the supposed debate over whether it's real or not. But insofar as they think about climate change, they think of it as this tragedy of the commons. And that's, <clears throat> as I'm sure most people are aware, this concept that an ecologist named Garrett Hyden came up with. He wrote an essay about the sheep in uh, the commons, these fields in England. And all the, each shepherd, of course, wanted his sheep to get fat. And so they all went there and they overgrazed. And though it was rational on each person's part, the, uh, the commons were destroyed in his conception. They're actually, this might not quite be right. Another thing people talk about a lot is fishing, overfishing, each fishing boat has its you know, has its desire to catch as much fish as possible. And even if this causes the population to collapse in the short term, they do it. People apply this to climate change as well. They say climate change is sort of the ultimate tragedy of the commons. And what I've found in these 24 countries is that that's kind of a bad frame for this. I just want to put that in your mind. Is this or is this not a tragedy of the commons? And I would suggest it's not. And now I'll start reading. The contract had called for either a boa or an anaconda whichever would best handle the crowds. And in the end, the bankers got the latter, a green anaconda, 
<clears throat> six feet long and 85 pounds, which hung from the neck of a long-haired snake handler who lurked amid the exotic plants next to the fake waterfall and the model dressed in Amazonian garb. Nearby were two scarlet macaws in wire cages, a Brazilian dance troupe, and a hut offering free organic smoothies. At the base of an 18-foot waterfall were giant koi swimming in a pond, 4,500 gallons of warm filtered water that would soon be dumped into the East River. The jungle was in a tent that was on the promenade at South Street, South Street Seaport in Lower Manhattan. 30 by 60 feet, suffused with a light mist and heated to 80 degrees, the tent had white sides and a clear roof through which visitors could just make out the skyscrapers of Wall Street. It was cold outside, a typical 39 degree February day in early 21st century New York, so those beckoned inside by the street team, which was two models walking the streets to entice passersby to the event, had to quickly shed their jackets and scarves. So stark was the difference in temperature, which was, of course, the point. The stunt was a coming out party, the most expensive stop on Deutsche Bank's 80 event, the Investment Climate is Changing Roadshow, held across the United States. In scale and imagination, it was rivaled only by the ski village and 90-foot snowboard slope the bank had constructed a few weeks earlier along Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. There were chalets decorated with deer antler chandeliers and wooden snowshoes, Deutsche Bank branded ice sculptures, models dressed as snow buddies, snow bunnies, <clears throat> bottled water from Iceland, faux snow blown down from the roof of a Versace store, 30 tons of more realistic snow created by a wood chipper and a freezer truck full of ice, and two pro snowboarders who would later complain that nobody had built them a proper jump. That, by the way, was to me personally. I called them, and that was the main takeaway they had from the event. Together, the Manhattan and Beverly Hills events cost $1.5 million, but they were carbon neutral, the bankers boasted. Their greenhouse emissions offset by investments in a biogas project in India. At South Street Seaport, every attendee was given a certificate from the carbon credit company as proof. The Jungle Party, which lasted three hours, produced 152 tons of greenhouse gases, which the average Indian would take three lifetimes to match. Before a DJ set by the Brazilian girls, a group with no actual Brazilians and only one girl, the bankers held a press conference. It was early 2008, and as the world was still reeling from a record melt in the Arctic and a scary film by Al Gore and a bleak report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, half a dozen major investment houses had launched global warming-themed mutual funds. Deutsche Banks was the $2.9 billion DWS climate change fund. The jungle event was meant to promote it. The press release had said, without taking a position on climate change, the DWS climate change fund is on the cutting edge of climate change investing. It's beautiful lingo. Um, the event's objective was not simply to show that climate change is happening, said the executive Axel Schwarzer, but that, relate, that it creates related climate change investment opportunities. Another release went further. The debate around climate change is shifting away from cost and risk, it said, toward the question of how to capitalize on exciting opportunities. Nothing as big and universal as climate change could be all bad. An ecological catastrophe was not necessarily a financial catastrophe for everyone. Deutsche Bank's chief climate strategist, Mark Fulton, worked in Midtown in a building on Park Avenue. And I visited him there after the road show was done, clearing security and then riding a silent elevator to the 27th floor. His was a corner office, but it was small and cluttered with papers. And Fulton, an Oxford-educated Australian, looked as much scientist as capitalist. His desire to fight climate change was genuine. He told me he'd read The Club of Rome's Limits to Growth, which is a neo-Malthusian take on the planet's carrying capacity as a schoolboy in the 70s. It made quite an impact, he said. They were talking about everything running out. But instead of working for Greenpeace, which he'd considered after graduation, he became a stockbroker, and then an analyst. And he'd eventually helped Deutsche Bank identify global warming as a mega trend that could generate profits for decades. It's always helped me, climate change, in my career, he joked. Well, the DWS fund invested most heavily in the technology to build a greener world, in wind power and solar power, in smart grids and smarter electrical meters. It had bought other stocks, too, companies that fit the portfolio not because they could help fight climate change, but because the warmer the world, the less habitable it became, the bigger the windfall. They were a tacit recognition that we were already failing to stop climate change. There was the planet's largest water company, Veolia, which manages pipes and builds desalination plants in 24 countries on five continents, 
Monsanto and Syngenta, ag biotech giants that were tweaking genes to develop drought-resistant crops, and Viterra, a fast-growing agribusiness in temperate Canada. The fund also had shares of Duyuan Global Water, one of the biggest water treatment companies in desiccating China, and in two fertilizer multinationals, Yara and Agrium. When asked Fulton how the bank planned to capitalize on rising sea levels, he mentioned a small play in a Dutch dredging company, Royal Bolscalis, which had just rebuilt an island in the Maldives, inundated by the 2004 tsunami. Where are you going to get seawall expertise but from the Dutch, he asked. Other climate investors told a similar story. They bought clean tech, green tech, the building blocks of a new low carbon economy, but they were also starting to hedge. In London, the Schroeder Global Climate Change Fund was investing in Russian farmland. Cheap, fertile soil suddenly made dear by milder winters and a drought-fueled global food crisis. And its manager was taking the logic a step further, buying stock in the supermarket chains, Carrefour and Tesco. If climate change will be a negative for crop yields, he told me, then people will just have to spend more on food. Retailers are a clear beneficiary. Across town, another fund manager explained why he was bullish on the reinsurers Munich RE and Swiss RE. He said, as natural disasters start to be more common, climate change, as climate change starts to cause flooding and more droughts, insurance companies, particular reinsurers, should get pricing power. Because it allows insurers to jack up rates, hurricane season is quite a positive thing, he said. A partner at a storied Wall Street investment bank showed me photographs of Ukrainian farmland and said that his firm had tried to buy, us, buy up vast tracts of it. Soviet-era collective farms had reverted to what he called pseudo-subsistence agriculture. You could come to these guys and get thousands of hectares for a few bottles of vodka and like two months of grain. You could literally give them vodka and grain. In the run-up to successive climate conferences in Copenhagen, Cancun, Durban, and Doha, as everybody else was fretting about polar bears and electric cars, some fund managers worried that I would misunderstand them, that I would mistake them for starry-eyed activists, that I would mistake theirs for just another green or socially responsible fund. A lot of people think, how do you invest in climate change and essentially come up with one or two or maybe three areas, like alternative energy, said Sophie Horsfall, a manager at Britain's FNC Global Climate Opportunities Fund. For us, well, there's, a lot, there's an awful lot more to it. We have to separate out the ethical issues. We have to move away from the environment, environmental issues. We have to take a step back. And I must have looked surprised. We have to think about the reality of climate change, she continued. It's quite difficult, isn't it? For decades, we have all known, at some level, about global warming. As a point of scientific inquiry, it is centuries old, first identified in the 1800s by John Tyndall and Svante Arrhenius. But as a source of popular anxiety and conversation, it dates to the first sophisticated computer models in the early 1970s in the first World Climate Conference in 1979 and landmark congressional testimony by the NASA atmospheric physicist James Hansen in 1988. It has been long, around long enough to become a cliche. I thank it for the heat wave I'm experiencing in Seattle as I write this. It wasn't now. <clears throat> and, and long enough to have birthed the newer cliche, the idea that we have so changed the planet with our engineering and our emissions that we now live in the Anthropocene, a new geologic epoch of man's own creation. Long enough, certainly, for something to have been done about it. In the new millennium, which has brought us Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, Lord Nicholas Stern's 700 pages, page long, Economics of Climate Change, and a string of failed climate legislation and UN conferences, the warnings have been ever louder and more sustained. The atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide, our principal contribution to the climate and the principal driver of warming, has only been rising. It is now 40% higher than pre-industrial levels higher than it's been any time in the last 800,000 years. In New York's Madison Square Garden, a 70-foot doomsday clock, which was unveiled by none other than Deutsche Bank, is tracking greenhouse gas levels in real time. Two billion metric tons added each month, or 800 a second, for a total of 3.7 trillion tons and counting. The ticker has 13 red digits, but when you stare at it from 7th Avenue, the last three are a blur. They're spinning too quickly to see. This book is about how we're preparing for the world we seem hell-bent on creating. It's about climate change, but not about the science of it, nor the politics, nor directly about how we can or why we should stop it. Instead, it's about bets being placed on a simple, cynical premise that we won't stop it anytime soon. It's about people, and mostly it's about people like me, northerners from the developed world, historically the emitter countries, as we're called, 
who occupy the high, dry ground, whether, whether real or metaphorical. I'm interested in climate change as a driver of human behavior, as a case study, the ultimate case study, and how we confront crisis. Warming will reshape the planet, and in broad strokes, we already know how. Hot places will get hotter. Wet places will get wetter. Ice will simply melt. Poor, mostly tropical countries, those least responsible for the consumption that fuels the factories that produce the emissions that cause the warming, will be hit the hardest. But wealthier, higher latitude regions, Europe, Canada, and the United States, are not entirely immune. The change is so vast, so universal, that it seems to test the limits of human reason. So it should not be surprising that the ideologies that led us here, those that have guided the post-industrial age, techno-lust and hyper-individualism, conflation of growth with progress, unflagging faith in unfettered markets, are the same ones that many now rely on as we try to find a way out. Nowhere is humankind's mix of vision and tunnel vision more apparent than in how we're planning for a warmed world. The idea that people have been irrational has lately been in vogue, and we can thank the global financial crisis for that. Behavioral economists have reminded us that the market, far from being a collection of fully logical individuals, is hostage to Keynesian animal spirits, which are the emotions and prejudices and impulses and shortcuts, part of every, nearly every human decision and every financial bubble, and part, no doubt, of our apathy about reducing carbon emissions. In the United States, nearly 98% of the federal climate research budget goes to the hard sciences, which have produced mounds of evidence for global warming, enough to make a believer of anyone who gives it an honest look, and produced increasingly refined computer models predicting an increasingly dire future. One prediction from MIT is of a median warming of 5.2 degrees Celsius by 2100 if we don't curtail emissions, a temperature spike that campaigners believe could entirely melt the polar ice cap in summertime turn parts of Central America and the Southern United States into a dust bowl, and wipe island nations off the map. The remaining 2% of the federal research budget goes to social scientists, such as those with Columbia University's Center for Re Research on Environmental Decisions, or CRED, who probe what may now be the most important question. If we know the risks, why aren't we doing anything? And the center's director, Elke Weber, suggests that at both levels where humans make their decisions, emotional and analytical, there are roadblocks. The emotional block is basically what we don't see doesn't scare us. As she says, the time delayed, abstract, and often statistical nature of the risks of global warming does not evoke strong visceral reactions. <laughs> At the analytical level, there is, along with the tension between individual and systemic risk, which is what you could call the tragedy of the commons, something that economists call hyperbolic discounting, and it goes like this. Offer to give someone either $5 today or $10 next year, and he'll probably take the $5. Among many activists, politicians, and scientists, the assumption is that climate change now suffers mainly from a PR problem. But if the proper nudges could be found or the reality of it made visceral, then the public will take action. But unspoken and scarcely examined is a second, much bigger assumption, that taking action means trying to cut carbon emissions. That taking action will take a certain shape green roofs, carbon caps, green cars, solar panels, footpaths, forests, fluorescent bulbs, bicycles, insulation, algae, inflated tires, showers, clotheslines, recycling, locavorism, light rail, wind farms, vegetarianism, heat pumps, telecommuting, smaller homes, smaller families, smaller lives. We hope that our collective fear of global warming will push us inevitably toward collective behavior. But what if the world as we know it goes on even as the earth as we know it begins to disappear? There's another possible response to melting ice caps and rising sea levels to the reality of climate change. It's a response that is tribal, primal, profit-driven, short-term, and not at all idealistic. It's every man for himself, every business for itself, every city for itself, every country for itself. There's the possibility that we take the $5. And now, Somewhat informally, I'll talk about these photos, all of which I took traveling about. <clears throat> this, as you can imagine, is a Canadian. <laughs> he's standing on a rock on Devon Island, which is the one I'd mentioned, and he's uh, pointing his gun at the Northwest Passage. It's not just the passage that's important up there, as I think people in Seattle are aware from, from Shell's drill ships being here in our bay for a while. The, uh, the big prize people talk about is oil. Uh, 
about 22% of the world's undiscovered petroleum was the thought. That's how much is up in the Arctic, above the Arctic Circle. That number's changed a bit thanks to fracking. You know, we've got a lot more natural gas here and about half of that number up in the Arctic was, was natural gas, not oil. But it's oil that oil companies want, uh, most of all. You know, we've, now that there's so much gas, gas prices are low, oil prices are still worth a lot. And the fact is we've gotten a lot of the easy oil already. Um, this is what was and may still be the world's northernmost natural gas plant in uh, Hammerfest, Norway. It's called Snow Viet or Snow White. And uh, this was perhaps a model for what the Arctic's future could be, uh, of course, before fracking, so I'm not sure how gas is doing up there. But it, uh, that flame, this is the first day they opened the plant, as it happens. And I climbed up this, this hillside behind it and in Norway at that time of year, which is about this time of year, feels sort of like Seattle today. And, and I was about two miles away, and I could feel that, the heat of that flame on my face. The, the first thing that this, that this uh, plant did was cough up a bunch of ash, and it coated all the cars of all the locals, and yet it's still massively popular. I mean, it's the, uh, the, the deputy mayor told me, you know, since, the, since we got this plant, you know, we've got so much money, they're, they're trying to electrify, you know, it's, it's got a permanent darkness in the wintertime, being so far north. So they're trying to electrify and sort of do an artificial sun so they can have street lights that just run all day and it's money from this. They've got this new library, they've got this new community center. And as he put it, you know, we used to, you know, people still, still get in fights, but not with knives anymore. So. <laughs> Actually, and this is, um, speaking of Shell, this is lease sale 193, which was held up in Anchorage. This was for $2.1 billion. Shell bought a bunch of oil blocks in the Chukchi Sea and uh, ConocoPhillips and Statoil, which is Norway's uh, main oil company, were behind it significantly. And this was the moment that Shell showed, sort of showed its cards and said, we're gonna get most of our crude from the Arctic within 30 years. And of course, as many people may know, this is just in the last week been put on hold again. It has a little bit to do with the fact that they uh, ran their drill ship into the rocks up in Kodiak, Alaska about a year ago. Had to sell it for scrap. And it has a lot to do with uh, the fact that this lease sale, which was done under the last administration, had a uh, questionable environmental impact assessment. It was, it was a bit rushed because there was a decision on the, whether the polar bear should be listed as a threatened species. And they wanted to get this lease sale done first, hence the polar bear suit. And uh, so they rushed it through. They did the environmental impact assessment based on one potential find of one billion barrels of oil. The actual size of the thing is about 30 billion barrels of oil. So a court looked at that environmental impact assessment and said, why would Shell spend this much money for one billion barrels of oil? Which is a lot, but it's not, it's not two billion worth. So they obviously they've made that invalid and so Shell had to stand down, but it still plans to, still plans to be there. This is uh, Greenland, and this is the Black Angel Mine, which has the highest grade zinc in the world, or at least once did, in the 70s. It was open for a couple years, or for a couple decades, and they thought they got all the good stuff. But in uh, the, the mid-2000s, they sent some geologists there to check it out, zinc prices were high again, and, and the shipping season to and from these fjords is lengthened by about two months, and the uh, and they said, well, let's go, let's go have a look. Technology might make it, make it they can get a little bit more of this. The geologists were taking a day hike, and they found one of the glaciers had pulled back. And underneath where the glacier had been, underneath the, foot of the former foot of the glacier, was a giant zinc deposit just as big as the first. So they reopened the mine and are hoping to do quite well. Greenland, Greenland in general, it's, um, <clears throat> as we know, it's melting. This is the Ilulisat Glacier that uh, one of those chunks eventually came off this glacier. This is, these are icebergs that come off the end of it. And uh, the Titanic hit one of these. It's the most productive glacier in the world. And, and just last week, some news came out that it sped up to unseen, unseen ice or record speeds. And, uh, but Greenland has an independence movement. It's got an independence movement based on the fact that they've been part of Denmark for over 100 years. 
and they get money from Denmark. All, they're 57,000 Greenlanders, and they want to be free, but they, they need Denmark's money. So their, their idea is that they're going to drill themselves free. They're going to get all the oil in their oil blocks on both sides of Greenland now. They've been sold to Exxon, Shell, Chevron, you name it. And they've got these mines opening up. People have probably heard a little bit about this. The idea they might import 2,000 Chinese workers. They've just uh, made it legal to get uranium, to mine for uranium. And, uh, and that's because they want to get rare earths. There might be the biggest rare earth deposit in Greenland out, that's outside of China, which has sort of a lockdown on it. And so they, you know, they've had a lot of elections that have turned on this. And they seem to be, they now already have something called self-governance. I, I traveled around in a road show with all the politicians going to villages like, oh, there's, there's an iceberg on the way to, to the mine. That's on the way to Black Angel. I went on this road show with the, with the major, major politicians of Greenland, which uh, 57,000 people, but they managed to have four different political parties and it's quite contentious. But all of them, basically agreed on independence. This, this village, which is Nia Kornat, a village of about 100 people, voted well to, to the man and woman and maybe baby, they all voted for independence. 100% turnout, 100% vote in favor. And as a whole, Greenland voted about 90% to basically, let's, let's do this, let's do this with drilling. This is Ashkelon in Israel. It's the... Uh, was the world's biggest desalination plant. And uh, it's arguably what, one of the things that keeps Israel alive, or at least increasingly will. And it's also a technology that's being exported all across the world. The company that had a lead in building this is called IDE, Israeli Desalination Enterprises. And they've got 400 plants around the world. Uh, any place that's rich and dry, you, they've got them. They're, they're working on the pretty contentious one in Southern California in Carlsbad. Uh, desalination is interesting because it's, uh, first of all, it's very expensive. It requires a lot of energy. And so basically it's a solution for countries that can afford it, which as you'll see is a theme here. Uh, if insofar as we're moving into a world that's adapting to climate change and people are trying to make money off it, well, a good way to make money is to sell things to people who have money, which means the more we move toward adaptation, and which is, as people know, Adapting is sort of living with the world we're making, whereas mitigating is the opposite, which is trying to cut emissions so we don't get this world. The more we're moving toward adaptation, the more you're seeing technologies like this sold to the richer parts of the world. And so it's mostly rich countries with water problems that are buying these. And so they're along the coast of China, eastern seaboard in China, all in every major city in Australia now, moving into California. And uh, one thing about desalination is the energy use is one thing that makes it expensive, and of course, that also means lots of emissions, tons of emissions, and it also has some other environmental problems. But from a climate perspective, this is a technology that you put it here in your town, you've got water, great, and then you're emitting a ton of carbon, so someone else gets it even worse. The same company uh, built the probably the best snowmaker in the world. This is in Australia, or I mean Austria, sorry. It's um, at the Pitts Tall Glacier, it's one of the high ski areas in Austria. And uh, my wife, Jenny, who's here somewhere behind the, the Klieg lights, so I can't see her, she and I were skiing here. They didn't need the snowmaker then. But they, they were having their glacier run out <clears throat> at, the, at the shoulder season. Basically, the glacier would run out before the bottom of the lifts. So skiers would ski down, and they'd have to walk the last 700 feet to get back on the lift, and that was, it was killing them. The Israelis, on their way to what is called reverse osmosis desalination, which is the kind of desalination that works the best, came up with a vacuum technology. One way to separate salt from, from water is to freeze it. Obviously, as, as everyone knows, ice doesn't have salt in it. So if you freeze it and you get the snow and you can somehow separate the salt that you froze out of it and then melt the snow, you've got water. And so at first, Israel was working on this technology. It turns out you can't make a big enough, and they were doing this through vacuums basically make a giant vacuum and lower the pressure enough and you can make ice. You can't do it at the kind of scale that actually works, but you can make a lot of snow that way, it turns out. So they started selling, the Israelis started selling the snow to the Alps. Zermatt has this too. These are uh, private for-profit firefighters at a 
at a fire outside of Los Angeles a few years ago. They were actually working for AIG, uh, the insurance company. A uh, local fire chief, one of about a dozen that I know of, realized that the public firefighters were getting outpaced, the fire season was getting worse, that, that you know, that it used to be a, sort of a fall thing that would match the winds that would come through. And now, as he said, you know, it's fire is a year-round event. We can have fire any time. And so climate change is one part of that. So they decided they're going to branch out into these private firefighting companies. And for a fee, they'll protect your home. And they realized the biggest money was actually insurers. A place like AIG, or I think it was Farmers, was the other one that was working with these guys. They, for their very high-value clients, anyone who had a, a home worth a million dollars or more, much cheaper for them to have private firefighters on call and send out these private firefighters to spray down the buildings and protect them from the fire than to let the, let the house burn. And so, you know, there's a, there's a logic to it, but I can tell you it's actually a really stupid way to fight fires. And, and there's a metaphor here. <clears throat> and the, basically, if you're putting out fires individually like this or, or trying to get ahead of it, you're doing the opposite of what the public firefighters were doing alongside us. The public firefighters were going to the fire. They're trying to stop it. It just was pretty straightforward. It was simple. It was not a complicated solution. These guys were trying to download these maps that showed just the AIG homes. They're trying to figure out where the fire is going, where the winds are shifting, so they can get ahead of the fire and spray the right client home at the right time to beat, out the, to beat the blaze. Sometimes they get it wrong. And of course, they're also busy downloading these maps in a disaster zone. Everyone's on their cell phone. They're not getting a good data connection. So we were just driving around like idiots. We didn't actually do anything. This was the only home that I saw. They actually, the fire was close. We actually beat it there. And I spent you know, a very long day with them. And they, they saved one home. Meanwhile, the public firefighters were, you know, there's a lot to criticize there too, but they, they were fighting the fire. Uh, this is that same neighborhood. I just like this photo. People were saving their horses. This is the All-American Canal. It runs along the border between California and Mexico in the Imperial Valley, which has a, if you're into uh, water, water rights and water law, then you uh, realize this is sort of a, a pivotal thing. The way that water works is, at least in the American West, whoever has the first use of a waterway gets a legal claim to it. It happens that this was kind of the first big straw into the Colorado River. And it's a major reason that California can survive now is that California was early to tapping the Colorado River so they get a bigger portion of it than do states upstream. Um, they realized that some of their water, this, this canal was lined with just dirt originally. It's about 100 years old. And they realized that their water was seeping through the bottom of it and it was bubbling up in Mexico, in the Mexicali Valley, which had become a major agricultural area because of it. So a few years ago, with San Diego's money and some federal money and support from Western state senators, um, I believe Feinstein was one of them, I can't remember who else, they, uh, they decided they were gonna line it with, with cement, with concrete, so that the water wouldn't seep through anymore and then they could get that water to San Diego. So that's what they did. Huge, multi-million dollar project. They lined the whole thing. Most of the workers were speaking Spanish when I visited. And, um, <clears throat> And they've probably got about 15 years in the Mexico, Mexicali Valley before they can't grow anything anymore. The water won't just disappear, it'll just be saline first. It would be really, it'll just kill their crops. And the guy on the right is a uh, hedge fund manager from New York. The guy on the left is the son of the most feared warlord in South Sudan. And they had a farmland venture together. They wanted to buy a Delaware-sized chunk of farmland in South Sudan and grow, grow food there. For reasons of the food crisis, it seemed that, and this is a major trend, people buying farmland in Africa especially, but all over the world, Brazil, uh, Gulf states, uh, the Chinese are moving into Russia. And so there's been this sort of new rush for Africa and other places to grow food as, as drought and other things cause us, you know, and population growth and, and more wealth in China that causes more eating more meat, which means it's more grain. So for all these different factors, people are rushing to buy up the farmland so they can then sell the food. Uh, so this was, their scheme was, was to do just that, although he planned to sell it locally first. 
This is uh, the other side of Africa and Senegal. This would be the Great Green Wall, these little seedlings. The Great Green Wall is a plan made by Africans to keep the Sahara from expanding. The idea is to do a 15 kilometer wide belt of trees that goes across the Sahel, which is that grasslands, sort of the borderlands between the tropical Africa and the Sahara Desert. And I'm not sure that deserts actually spread this way, that you can just do this sort of old school warfare against it and just build a phalanx of trees, but it's, it's about the best they can do. There's, there's little international funding for it. There's not much funding at all for Africa to prepare for, for climate change. And this again was one of the things that underscored for me how different climate change will be for the rest of the world and places like us. You know, even if it's bad here in the West, we can do things that are much more sensible and spend a lot more money than this. Senegal I chose also because they, they have huge outmigration to Europe in, in the way that Latin Americans come to the States. Senegalese try to go to Europe for jobs, less of it now with Europe's financial crisis. But one, one thing that the Great Green Wall was, was to first to keep people whose lands were going from, from arable to desert there, but it was also just to give them a job. It was a make work project. So it, it, it was about climate change in a couple of different ways. And one of them was that all the kids are like, we can't farm here anymore, moving to the cities and then from the cities onto the coast, and from the coast onto Europe. These are some of those same kids. This is where some of them end up in Malta. Malta is a, uh, for those who don't know, it's a small island off of Italy. It's its own country, the second most densely populated island off of, uh, outside of Singapore. And it, these boats here are made by the, the criminal syndicates that send the migrants across the water. And, uh, and they end up here in Malta. They're not trying to get to Malta, they're trying to get to Italy. And then they can be in the EU. The EU has a rule that whoever gets a migrant has to deal with them which is actually quite unfair to places like Malta because they're, they're not trying to get to Malta, they're trying to get to France or they're trying to get to Germany or, or wherever, Holland. But they, they get off course as they come across from Libya and they end up in Malta. As a deterrent, Malta throws them in jail for 18 months. I, I visited those cells and they're just like dormitories. They're like youth hostels that Georg Proskurowski and I used to stay in, <clears throat> but worse. And um, then after those 18 months, they can't leave Malta. So then they're put in these tent camps outside. And anyway, Malta recently just said that uh, non, well, they didn't say non-African, but, but other immigrants who have a million euros to pay can now buy a Maltese passport. So they're not totally against immigration, just of a certain kind. This is Bangladesh. This is right where Cyclone Sitter hit in, I think, 2007. And it's a school. But all the schools now being built in the Cyclone area are being built on stilts so they can double as as refuges during cyclones. Uh, in Bangladesh, it's not, it's not just that they're, you know, they obviously had always, have always had storms and flooding. The main signal of climate change is actually the slow creep of salt water. As the water table goes up, you know, the, the water they're putting on their crops is not as, it's not as fresh as it once was. It's saltier and saltier, so they're able to grow less rice. So it's one of the reasons that I think something like 500,000 people move now to Dhaka, the capital, every year. I took the ferries down to here and uh, pretty empty on the way down. And my, the guy who was showing me around on the way back, he said, look, look how full they are now. Look at all those families down there. And you could see in the, on the bottom deck, it's just packed with people, you know, like three times as many people coming back up to Dhaka. Uh, the other thing that is happening is people are trying to go to India and it's a growing reason. Uh, India was already building this, which is the largest border fence in the world. It goes all the way around Bangladesh. And climate change is increasingly used as, a, as an excuse to build this. It's not, it's not why they started, but it might be why they finish. Speaking of walls, this is the uh, Maeslant Sea Barrier in Rotterdam in Holland. Rotterdam is the most important port in, in Europe. It's actually where Shell has its headquarters near there. It's where most of the oil and, and gas coming into Europe arrive. Actually, most of oil, the gas comes by pipe. And they come into this port in this very important city. 
and increasingly it's threatened by, like all of Holland, by sea level rise and storms. And they have a computer system called the BOSS. And the BOSS looks at climate signals and it looks at the storms that are coming and it looks at the tide surge. And whenever there's a problem, it, it's made to close these massive gates, which are about the size of the Eiffel Tower, two of them, and then something comes up from the bottom and it seals off the port of Rotterdam. And it's, it's a hugely expensive project. And, uh, and this same design is, is one of the ones that's been proposed for New York City, right at the Narrows, below the Verrazano Bridge. That would cost about $10 billion. So, and the uh, Dutch firms that are doing all this technology, they've actually, Holland isn't so worried about climate change. They're not, they've kind of got it figured out. They've got their seawalls, they think they can be okay for a while. I mean, they're not, they're worried, certainly in the sense that they're doing things about it, but they're not worried in a, in a mortal kind of way. And some of the firms are very excited to sell this technology to the rest of the world. Uh, New York City has, you know, as I said, it would be a $10 billion project. And, and again, who can pay for this stuff? Well, we can, but Bangladesh can't. This is a door at the Mosquito Control District in Key West, Florida, which had uh, the first outbreak of dengue fever in the United States in a very long time, where it was, it was actually local. The mosquitoes were there living in, in uh, Key West. For complicated reasons, climate change may, may cause dengue to spread. The same has been said about malaria. There's plenty of reason to fight it as it is, but it's now spreading into places like Florida, and uh, potentially it could get into Southern Europe. And when that does, perhaps drug companies will pay more attention to the problem. You know, it's any malaria drugs have languished for a long time. Key West I chose because, because they'd had this outbreak, but also because it may be the first place in the States where genetically modified mosquitoes are released on purpose. <clears throat> and the idea, as the scientist told me, it's a, it's a British company called Oxitec. And their plan is to create super sexy male mosquitoes that the females want to mate with. The um, male mosquitoes don't bite. And, um, and if they mate with these genetically modified males, there's a kill switch basically inside them. They, uh, they've been modified that the larvae, the, the offspring will die in the larvae stage, most of them. Actually, it's about some very small percentage will seemingly survive in some of these tests, which is why some campaigners are afraid uh, of the genetically modified mosquito releases, and especially afraid that no one's really telling the, <clears throat> telling the public this is happening. Because less than 1% is a very small number of mosquitoes to maybe survive, but it's not small when you're releasing hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes on a daily basis to suppress the wild population. But the alternative is more chemicals. So I'm, not, I'm actually somewhat agnostic as to whether these genetically modified mosquitoes are, are good or bad. Uh, Certainly the company making them is hoping to get quite rich. And finally, there's the, there's the Kolok. That's the shell drill ship that had a brief stay here in, in Seattle. And this is right after it hit the rocks up in Kodiak, Alaska. And this is, they dragged it off. Actually, just today, that, that ship on the bottom right is the Ivik. I took the train down from Bellingham and I saw it sitting there in, in port with kind of nothing to do. That, that drill ship, you can't quite see it listing, but it is. Shortly after this photo was taken, it got put on another giant ship, taken to Asia, away from the press, and scrapped. And as, as we've talked about, Shell's plans are on the rocks. Actually, speaking of the rocks, these are the very rocks that, they, that it hit. This is Sitkalitic Island off of Kodiak in Alaska. Those are the lifeboats from the Kulik. And, and Shell was really interesting to me, and, and this would be sort of the last thing, because it's a very incredibly intelligent company. They were, you don't think of oil companies as believers in climate change, but actually all of them are. Uh, even Exxon now has stopped funding climate denier groups, so far as I know, and says on its website, we believe climate change is bad for society and needs to be dealt with. But they were decades behind Shell, which 30 years ago had an internal carbon price. It's sort of famous for its futurists and its futurism and had all sorts of scenarios about what the world could be like. So I, I took it as very, first of all, I talked to these guys, these futurists, and, and they're, they're smart. They, they can see the big picture, and they know that climate change is gonna be a problem for their business, and it's one reason that Shell is heavier in natural gas now than it is in oil, because natural gas emits less carbon. 
So they are planning for this world. They did invest in some green energy, though they sort of pulled out of a lot of that because they invested in the Arctic. It, I took it as very significant that Shell was the first, one of the first to believe in climate change of the oil majors, and it was the first mover up in the Arctic as, as they were drilling. And then when the drill ship hit the rocks, and you saw how incompetent the smartest oil company was, it was, again, for me, a, a parable of how we kind of rely on the smartest guys. <coughs> Always the, the smartest guys in the room are the ones we really are impressed with. And they have these great ideas. And a lot of the ideas we're seeing as we go toward adaptation are these big engineering ideas, <coughs> reliant on really smart solutions to what's a very straightforward, simple problem of emissions. And I think there's a danger in that. I'm not anti-technology, but again, this is the smartest oil company, and they slammed right into that. And I think that's it. You mentioned that you thought that perhaps a tragedy of the commons was not the appropriate frame yeah. with which to think about this, and I was wondering if you had uh, any insight in a more productive way to yeah. think about this. Uh, sorry, that's actually a very good question, because otherwise I wouldn't even <clears throat> have closed out that thought. So the reason I think it's not a great, a great way to look at climate change is that uh, the proverbial sheep that some of us have are so much bigger. And basically, some of our sheep eat, eat so much more. And, um, but that's part of it. And the other thing is it's not clear that if some people are getting rich off this, that it's bad for everybody. And the classic tragedy of the commons is the grassland goes away, nobody's sheep can eat. Climate change is much more complicated than that. It is unfortunately not, at least in certain time scales, a net negative for some regions. It's not a net negative for Greenland. It's not a net negative for, you know, maybe Canada. I'm not sure on that. But <clears throat> the, the effects of it are very lopsided. And if that's true, it, it slows it down, you know. It's, it's less incentive for those of us who have less, less at risk to do anything about the problem. And, and that's, that's why I don't think it's a good frame, because it's, we're not, if we're not all that scared, and even if we can rationally look at it, then I, I just don't know what we'll, if we'll do as much as we should. I, I have, I'm going to criticize your premise. Okay. Because I believe you're generalizing two important stories into one, and it, it's dangerous. When you started your slideshow, I would agree that you told this story with your slides about businesses trying to make money on adaptation, and I think that's a really important story. In, in your reading, you talked about Deutsche Bank and Munich Re and Swiss Re particularly. Um, and, and, and the context for what I'm gonna say is that the European Commissioner for Climate Change, whose name is Connie Hedegaard, says very explicitly that what she is talking about is not deindustrialization, but reindustrialization. And in that context, we're talking about, if we're really lucky, swapping out the biggest business in the world for another business. That's about mitigation, not adaptation. I'm, in my work over the last five years, which I think is probably around the time of your research, um, I have on my computer over there 20 studies from Deutsche Bank, Munich Re, Swiss Re, the latter two not talking about adaptation, but pointing very explicitly to the need to the world to mitigate. Mm -hmm. And they're saying essentially in report after report that the insurance industry is gonna drown in what's gonna happen unless there's serious mitigation. In Deutsche Bank, I, mean, I have many studies on my computer about solar, they're, they're one of the, their researchers did some of the initial studies on, on grid parity, on wind, on the basic effort to build clean energy, energy infrastructure. I'm sure there are people in Deutsche Bank also working on making money in adaptation, but centrally, they're, they're very focused on building out clean energy infrastructure, and, and, and your story doesn't tell that, at least in the way you put it. I don't yeah. think there's anything cynical about the first part. And, and no, I don't, th I don't think so either, and I, I think it's fair, it's fair to recognize that I don't think the bulk of money is going to what I'm talking about here. But the, uh, the bulk of money, if you look at even Deutsche Bank, which you're right, they were doing these green funds. Uh, they did shut them down because they weren't making enough money. So uh, the point is that they're in the money-making business. And, and I think you're right that on a macro level, 
it's it's bad for business. You know, the, if you're a hedge fund person, and I have a friend at a hedge fund in New York, and I've talked to him about this, they're not excited about climate change. They might try to find an angle on it, but they're not excited about it because it's it could knock out two to three percent of the economy here, and they're they're basically playing the stock market for the most part. You know, and they want if all stocks go down, they get hit. It's just it's a net bad. That said, I think it's a very important thing to understand that these business is business. It's not, none of these things, for the most part, are done because they want to do good. And once you understand that, and then you understand that the climate change's impacts aren't equal, that certain places aren't gonna hit, get hit as badly, that some places will even make money off climate change, then you understand that it's not just automatic that we're gonna go toward mitigation in every one. And, and unfortunately, Deutsche Bank is a great example of that, and that they were starting to hedge. But that is not to take away from the fact that I think they've been a force for good. That's, that's not at all. Or to, like I said, in the, in the reading, they, you know, he was a true, he was a believer that he needed to fight climate change. They wanted to do it. Most of their investments were in green energy. But that's not what I said. What I said in the case of, if, if you believe that, that there's a reasonable chance that we're gonna to have to get rid of fossil fuels, that means building a new, the biggest business in the world, and there is opportunity to make money on that, and, and that's value neutral, except if you, if you make the bet. Oh yeah, I agree, I agree. I mean, I'm, so, so I agree, I'm just not certain that's what happened. I mean, Deutsche Bank shut down that green fund. They, they shut it down a well, couple years ago because it wasn't making enough money. Um, Swiss RE and Munich RE are, I think they've been forces for good as well. Just because Deutsche Bank is investing in them, he's, they're investing in them because they're climate realists. But the fact is, not me, but these climate change funds are investing in those guys because they're set to make more money. You know, it's climate change for insurance companies is free advertising on a biblical scale. It's a bigger market. And they're gonna leave, they're gonna leave areas, if they're trying to make money, and they can see climate change faster than the rest of us can, They'll, what will happen was, will be what happened in Florida after, uh, after Katrina, which is all the big insurance companies left. They just stopped insuring people because they, they're like, this is stupid. We're not gonna make any money here. We've got too much exposure. The point is, is that business is much more strategic about this than the rest of us. And that's not a negative, I'm, I'm glad they are. But it's also not clear, it is not stimulus, climate change is real response, therefore I'll go green. It's more complicated than that, and I think we need to understand that. There seems to be this kind of dichotomy between adaptation and mitigation, but of course mm -hmm. both of these things will be occurring simultaneously. Yeah. So let's say that we as a, na a nation and maybe as a globe do get our act together and are able to uh, begin to curb our emissions in a meaningful way. To what extent do the passive forces of what we've already done require the adaptations that you're talking about? Could you speak to That's that a little question. bit? That's a good question. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't say this out loud, or I don't think I did. But yeah, we've, we've already got so much we've already emitted so much carbon that we've got some warming ahead of us. We've already warmed the earth a little bit and, and there's gonna be more. We're, we're right now living with the uh, carbon emissions from the 80s perhaps, it's a bit inexact. So we've got another 30 years and that's if we were to bring down our emissions to very little right now, that's not gonna happen. So adaptation is now inevitable and it's one reason why it's not bad that adaptation is happening. I don't think this whole dichotomy between one is good and one is bad isn't valid anymore. It may have been years ago when it seems like adaptation would take energy away from mitigation. But the important point with adaptation is that it needs to be more fair than it's happening right now. If you look at the money going into, say, these adaptation funds that the, that the UN set up or the climate conferences have set up, basically nothing, effectively nothing. They're just empty shells. And and for me, the, the biggest takeaway here is that, that we, and especially places like Seattle, we can afford what we, to do what we need to do to live with climate change for a much longer period of time than can the rest of the world. It's, it's gonna be bad for all of us eventually, and I think there will be a market case in, you know, at six degrees, like nobody wants that especially. But at, but at one degree, you know, one degree warming, if you're a Canadian or a Greenlander, you might be like, eh, okay. And that matters a lot because 
because of this time lag. You know, the, if we don't do anything for a full degree because we're not really that scared yet, and then we've still got all that extra warming on top of that, then, you know, we might be fine, sort of, and we'll be screwing a lot of the rest of the world. I know the book's not about deniers, mm -hmm. but uh, they are definitely not insignificant. About 55% of the Republican members of the House, 65% mm -hmm. of the senators, Republican senators, and most of the leadership are deniers. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it might be just expedience. Yeah, I think it is. But they are a factor in our policy, mm -hmm. and obviously with the EPA now approaching the issue of existing coal plants. And there was a great article this morning, by the way, in the New York Times about mm -hmm. that. They're going to be in there attacking EPA in significant ways. So we need to look at that. And how would you say the <coughs> deniers are helping or hindering business? The business people recognize the risk, and the deniers are probably hurting them more than they're helping them. Yeah, and I think there was another story in the, in the Times about Coca-Cola recently, about how Coca-Cola is really worried about, you know, they're worried about water. You know, The main thing that goes into Coca-Cola is water. Yeah. And they're worried about their water, and they're worried about climate change for that reason. So they're starting to push for some sort of climate action for that very, that very reason. I, I think it's good that business, you know, from a, from a denier perspective, it's good that business is paying more attention to climate change. I mean, the stuff I'm talking about is still pretty frontier. As the man over there was saying, most of business is, if they're paying attention to climate change, they're paying attention to mitigation, and that's even better. But the, the mere fact that, that places like Shell and Exxon don't deny climate change anymore yeah. is, I think, going to be politically good. But I, you know, I, it's totally, irra it's totally irrational, so I have no idea what you can really do about it. It's like yeah, talking to a... Yeah, the legacy is still there, though. Right, Exxon yeah. Mobil's legacy with Heartland... Oh, I, I don't mean to say that they're yeah. good by any means. I just mean that that you kind of lose those... The, the crazy is going to lose oxygen a little bit. But, I mean, it's... Like, how, how do you talk to a brick wall but, but dumber? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>